Bingo, we're back. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And today we have a special show, uh, Community Matters. It's about tourism. Can tourism save, sustain, I should say, sustain Hawaii? And for that show, we have Jerry Agrusa. He's professor of hospitality and tourism at Hawaii Pacific University in the business school. And Frank Haas, who's a tourism marketing consultant and also, what, a, a teacher at Kapiolani Community College. That's right, and I was at Hawaii Tourism Authority, so I've been uh, And yes, and yeah. years and years of experience and developing the industry at Hawaii Tourism Authority. So the first part of our show, I want to talk about how it's going, gentlemen. Okay. Uh, so Jerry, uh, you probably talk to your classes all the time, and I know Frank talks to your classes too. Yep, he did a great job the other night. Oh, maybe he should start. Yeah, Frank, okay. how is tourism doing in the state of Hawaii? 2016, 2017, we are doing extraordinarily well. Uh, we have 8.8 uh, .8 million visitors. We've got almost uh, 15 billion dollars in visitor spending. So uh, on the surface, things are really looking good. But my nickname is Dr. Doom because uh, <laughs> even when things are going well, you heard it here. <laughs> I'm always looking for you know what do we have to fix that's lying under the surface, and there are some issues out there that we need to be addressing. We're going to talk about that in the second part of the show. So let's get the metrics. What are the metrics? Well, uh, it looks like here Oahu is just gangbusters. Waikiki is full to the brim all the time. So what we need to do is help disperse some of that tourism, get it out to the Outer Islands. The Outer Islands are still very cyclical. They have shoulder periods, which is good for them because then the employees at least can catch a breather. Here in, in uh, Waikiki, they're running 90% minimum across the board and everybody's tired. So Waikiki is still, is still the top of the line. Most people go to Waikiki. Well, the structurally it's changed too because Waikiki is now a uh, epicenter for uh, international visitors coming here. So the mix has changed. It used to be Japanese and Western visitors, uh, domestic visitors. Now it's uh, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Taiwanese. They all like this product here. And actually, it's displacing some of the domestic visitors to the neighbor islands, which is actually good. When you say displacing, you mean that they're going there involuntarily? No, I think they, uh, there are two things going on. One is they've become more familiar with uh, Hawaii as a product, and they've been, been to Waikiki, done that, and now they want to see the other islands. But also, uh, the uh, just the availability in Waikiki, as, as Jerry said, you're running 85, 90% occupancy a lot. And so if you can't find a room in Oahu, you might go somewhere else. Yeah, sure. What about room rates? How are they doing? Average in Waikiki is running around 225. I can't remember the number for the state, but that I used to be able to buy a car for that. <laughs> well, those numbers have been steadily increasing. And, and uh, when I was at Hawaii Tourism Authority, which was uh, I left in 2007 or so, uh, our strategy was to really uh, focus on uh, rates rather than um, bodies. And that gets back to your issue about sustainability. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about that, and I you, promise. <laughs> and then to add to that, the Outer Islands are really, really doing well, especially places like Maui, where they're right now is high season, whale season, and they're getting close to 400. And, you know, when even former students of mine that are running some of those hotels over there, they'll say, Dr. A, I, I can't get your room. And wow, I, was like, I, wow. and, and I helped you. And, and I helped to get you? through school. <laughs> what about rates on the neighbor islands? Are they higher, lower, what? Well, they're, they're generally higher. Because um, the, the problem, hotels are cut above, yeah? Yes, uh, there are more resorts on the neighbor islands. There's mm -hmm. more fewer hotels here. But things are changing. We have a Four Seasons resort that just opened here in Koalina. Uh, Holly Kalani, Trump Tower, a lot of these places are, uh, there's a luxury product here that didn't exist in large numbers before. Mm. Right, the Ritz-Carlton just opened too. So are things moving to Kapolei? Are they moving west in Oahu? That's another complicated question. Uh, to some degree, yes. Uh, if you look at where the product has uh, sprung up, you've got Alani that uh, went in Colina. You just had the, the, the Four Seasons uh, renovated property there. You've got a, uh, uh, an inclusive resort that the Chinese are going to develop uh, in that area. The other thing that's happening, and this gets back to capacity and, and uh, sustainability, is the rise of non-traditional accommodations, bed and breakfast, uh, oh, Airbnb, Airbnb. Ooh, big right. factor, we have to it? figure out how to live with that reality. Yeah. You mentioned a little while ago that you want to get them out, you want to get them out of Waikiki. If they go to Kailua, they wind up in the middle of a protest. Yeah? Sure, and Kailua is not just out of Waikiki. We want to get them out to Kauai, to uh, Big Island, you know, the Kona side, as well as the Hilo side. Uh, you know, we maybe get to Lanai. 
because you can it helps keep those people employed and and get, you know gets more than just the normal uh, 35 40 hours a week get a little overtime once in a while yeah well talk about that I mean uh, there's a lot of jobs in tourism yeah all kinds of jobs it's not just folding hospital corners and banquet management and uh, gee I don't know what in all the hotels um, but there's a lot of jobs a lot of activity economic activity that flows out of tourism right. you know? Uh, direct direct employment is somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 percent or so. Uh, uh, in percent of the of of, entire of state workforce. Yes. yes. Oh. Yes, yes. And uh, when four. you talk about indirect employment, um, I've been teaching a class, and I've had people coming in who are have jobs that are not strictly tourism, but it's related to tourism, sure. like a risk manager. I just had a risk manager come in because we're going to talk about risk, but he's a very, he's got a very highly paid job, very specialist job, but he's doing the risk uh, assessment for a lot of important properties here. What about, uh, you know, you talk about uh, risk management, but there's also accountants who specialize in tourism right. and lawyers who do a lot of right. tourism work and banks that love to make right. credit facilities um, for, for uh, you know, tourist operations, big hotels included. That's their favorite kind of business because it's, it's gold-plated, you know, to get repaid. So um, there's a lot of the business community is, um, so you say 25% of the workforce. That's direct. It, it's probably, you know, a, a good percentage of the whole economy. Um, I would say if, I, if I'm 45. calling my numbers, it's in the neighborhood of 40% of the GDP. Yeah. Whoa. Well, and it may not capture everything because of the secondary right. effect. Correct. Yeah. Okay, so where, where is it expanding greatest? I mean, would you say that the neighbor islands are expanding? Is capital going in there faster? Or is capital going to Capolé? Or there's been a lot of, you know, development uh, around the reef there and international marketplace. I don't know if you can say there's more hotel rooms, but there's been a lot of money put in the last few years. Yeah, I think the big thing will be this uh, out in Coalina, the Atlantis, $1.5 billion. You know, this is an uh, unbelievable amount of money that this Chinese group is going to put in. And uh, it's going to help, uh, like we said, you, we were talking about direct. Well, they have to build that property. So all the construction workers that will go into there and all of the delivery of the construction materials and then all the beds and all the carpets, it's going to be a monster. Well, what does it mean that the Chinese are here? You know, we were waiting, we wondered, we wasn't sure that well, we were coming. The Chinese no. investors are investors. here. The, 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 the visitors are still coming, but the not, in, not in huge numbers, which is probably a good thing. You want to balance your, your markets. You don't want it to be dominated by any one market. Right. So If you do that, want, then the other guys don't like it. That's right. And we want, <laughs> we want the right kind of Chinese. You know, there's 1.3 billion people in China we want we want the people that spend money that uh that, uh, or that 1.2 billion. Yeah. <laughs> I'm only kidding. Well, there are a lot of those. But uh, the other thing to your question is um, the brand is so strong that uh, you're seeing development that we couldn't have imagined before. It's repurposing buildings. The Waikiki Trade Center is now a hotel. Yeah. Um, yeah. The development of Airbnbs and vacation rentals are coming because uh, multiple repeat visitors are looking for a different kind of experience. So the market, the and free maybe market. maybe a lower price. Some of them are a lower price, some of them is just a different experience. Yeah. Right. It isn't always a lower price because sometimes the Airbnb, I did a, a, a study on it and uh, last year and uh, is Hawaii Hotels ready for this? And not all of the properties are lower priced. Some of them are actually higher priced. The Airbnbs account for sometimes luxury properties where people want to spend a night or two, which they could never actually ever li live there. And it's a, it's a good experience. And my own advice, and this personal to the hotel industry, is they're not a threat. The, the people that are going to Airbnb and vacation rentals are a different animal. So it's, uh, there's still a huge market, a huge number of people that want the hotel experience, sure. the resort experience. The location, people, yeah, the, yeah, the luxury of it. Whatever. And the security yeah. of it, knowing what you're going to get as a product. That's the biggest yeah, thing. You don't want to make a long trip with, with a, you know, something unpredictable. Correct. Well, I, I wanted to ask you one more question before we go to the break, and, that, and that's this. Um, you know, the, 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 there's a lot of profit. I mean, in the picture you paint, there's a lot of profit. Uh, I've always felt, though, that the capital concentrations that earn the profit with their investments, you know, most most of the big ones are offshore, right? Leakage. And that means, correct me if I'm wrong, but that means that the profit goes offshore. Am I right? That That is called leakage. That's leakage, yes, sir. Leakage. You are correct. There's How about a term flood of leakage. Yeah. <laughs> we have a huge amount of leakage because of the number of properties now that have been purchased. Uh, by either investment groups as well as uh, we just had uh, outrigger sell 
just recently to a... Uh, oh, sure, a big deal. Yeah, big deal, and that, that company... You don't know, know what, it, what it sold for. No, they didn't That's, tell me. Uh, this is me, Jay, your friend. <laughs> I know, I'm a, more than a professor makes in, in you, a year. <laughs> uh, that I can assure you. But well, back to your other question, Jay, I, I, we want to get before we go to break, uh, is on some other ways that we're attracting vi uh, visitors, and one of the things that I wanted to share with the, with the audience is that new movie, uh, Moana. Oh, yeah, please. And uh, we have uh, one of my graduate students is doing a study on uh, the, the uh, film and looking at it with people who now, after seeing the movie Moana, are they wanting to go in, uh, uh, come visit us. Uh, uh, we'll, the, le, this week is the 11th week of the showing of the, the show, and it's already did $550 million. There it is. Wow. Yeah, there it is. And uh, well, that's working off the uh, the brand, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, they did. Disney did a really good job with it. And uh, as you can see here in the slide, you have uh, both Maui, the god, uh, demigod, and then uh, Moana. And that's a local girl that played her that voice. And uh, she's a Kamehameha grad, uh, student. She's not a grad. She's only like 16 or 17 wow. years old. And she's done really, really well for herself. Uh, the next slide will have. Uh, uh, you can look how they partnered with Hawaiian Airlines. Oh, yeah. I was on one of these planes recently, and it's not just the outside, but inside the plane where you put the baggage is all decorated as well. <laughs> so they've done a really good job of partnering with Hawaiian Airlines, and it's a draw. What They had some uh, pushback. Hiccups. Hiccups, all right, <laughs> pushback. Here they had a costume that was for um, Halloween, and actually they had to pull it. And Disney very rarely pulls things, and Disney doesn't make one or two at a time. They make, you know, hundreds of thousands at one time. And right before Halloween, they had to pull this costume. And uh, it well, wasn't it was culturally... treated as, as, as racist? Yeah, they felt it wasn't culturally it's sensitive. It's the Polynesian version of blackface. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. So they pulled that, and um, and people were not, uh, not very happy. I know that we are all speaking to some of the... Uh, folks here that are, are actually against the movie, they feel that it that it isn't uh, uh, sensitive uh, sensitive enough. Yeah, yeah. Right. And then uh, there's a, a wait a minute. There's a funny looking character. There is a the funny character right there yeah. in in that movie. They've really gone the distance on this one. Correct. And then one more slide here. I I, I think we we have it. Here's a website that uh, my graduate student or former graduate student. She graduated already, but we're still trying to get this paper published. Uh, if you'd like to come and uh, go on the Survey Monkey and fill out a survey uh, on the movie Moana, like I said earlier, they did a, they've done $555 million in sales in the first 11 weeks in box office sales. Uh, another thing is they're selling is the mem uh, the memorabilia. This is the number one selling product at the Disney store. This is his name is Pua, and uh, at the Disney store they can't keep it in stock. As soon as it comes on the shelf. I was actually in line to buy this, and uh, two ladies came to me. Where did you get that? I said, that was the last one there. <laughs> Would you sell that to me? I said, I'm sorry, I need it for a TV show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Your students must love you, you guys. You're so energetic. But let's take a minute, and everybody can fill out the survey and Survey Monkey, and then we'll come back and talk about hmm, the other side of tourism. Okay. Watching this show at 12 o'clock on Friday afternoon. Stan, the energy man, watch it. And Hello, huh? How you doing? It's me, Angus McTech, wishing you to welcome and join us to see us on Hibachi Talk on Think Tech Hawaii. Join my co hosts, Gordo the Tech Czar and Andrew the Security Guy, every Friday from 1300 to 1345. We look forward to seeing you. We'll talk tech and we'll have some wee bit of fun. And remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. Aloha. Aloha. I am Reg Baker and I am the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We broadcast live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30 in the Think Tech studios in downtown Honolulu. We highlight successful stories about businesses and individuals and learn their secrets to success. I hope you can join us on our next show on Thursday at 2 o'clock. Until then, aloha.
Yes, community does matter. I'm Jay Fidel. We have Jerry Agrusa and Frank Haas here talking about tourism. Is tourism sustainable? Can tourism sustain Hawaii? So the first question I want to ask you guys as professors of tourism is uh, what, what's eating away, if anything, at it? What is pulling in the other direction? What should we be worrying about if we have capital investment in tourism? Well, speaking as, do as Dr. Doom, there's, uh, there's lots of things that could happen, and you do, you do need to think about those things. Right now, we're in a good place, strong brands, strong numbers. But uh, if you look at what's underneath that could happen, um, there's a variety of things. Uh, uh, things like uh, Zika virus. Uh, if you remember the SARS virus in mm, 2000, sure. um, 2006, yeah. or no, it's earlier than 2003. Early, earlier. Anyway, we lost more Japanese visitors to the SARS than we did to 9-11. Um, so uh, any of these diseases that could happen, Ebola, if it comes up again, uh, there's the, the, the whole issue of um, the social fabric. You know, how, uh, the, the eternal question is how many visitors are too many visitors, and, how, and at what point do you start deproving the, um, the resident experience because of the, the visitor load. Is that happening already? It depends on who you ask and where you are. <laughs> and uh, there are ways to manage that, but it's, it's, it's hard because we can't simply dictate things. We can't, if you, if you buy a property, you're going to uh, build to that capacity for that property. So that's where you end up getting high density. Uh, but there, well, as I said, there are probably some ways around that. A lot of these visitors want to go out and see neighborhoods like Kailua. And if you go to Kailua on a weekend when all the residents want to go to the beach, it's, it's crowded and people complain. Monday through Friday, it's not so much of a problem. So we need to think about those kinds of solutions. Uh, some other things that could happen, certainly terrorism, um, certainly policy. Uh, Brand USA, uh, which is the uh, national promotional arm for the federal government, came out with a, um, uh, a concern about uh, extreme vetting. You know, what happens if we get so concerned about security that we start to choke off uh, travel, um, crime, t terrorism. We've, ha we've had these things occur before, but um, we just need to be aware of them. And, and then there are the natural disasters, uh, tsunami, hurricane. If we had a hurricane on Oahu uh, with the same magnitude as we had in Niki and back then, it's, it's, that's a game changer. Yes. Uh, and as you mentioned there about the, and Frank mentioned about the vetting, uh, we just got this week, we got word that uh, Asia Air uh, X is going to now come from uh, Malaysia. Uh, they'll stop through Japan to come here with, you know, a, a 300 uh, seat capacity plane will come four times a week. This is good, except Malaysia is a Muslim country. Yeah. So it could be put on that list. And it, and it took six years for them to, ne to develop this type of uh, uh, agreement to get uh, Asian air to come here. Could now, be snuffed in no time with an sure. executive order. Oh, some, yeah. well, yeah. As long as we're talking about airlines, the, there are some unintended consequences. And the airlines are absolutely critical. I mean, you can't drive here, so right. you've got to be worried about the airlines. Yeah. So uh, there are people right now talking about, uh, with some excitement, about people like Southwest possibly coming in or another low-cost carrier coming in. There may be some unintended consequences with that. It's certainly nice for the consumer to have low fares, but if the overall, if it starts a fare war, and then United and Delta and American say, we're not making any money here, they're gonna pull their seats. So tourism is a very complicated and very delicate balance. And we have to, you know, you, we have to worry about air, air, air seats and airlines, because nobody comes here any other way yeah. except by air. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, this, that's a scary picture, but let me add one. Climate change. Climate change. I just had Tom Murray talk to my class about climate change. They're talking about a one-meter rise in sea level. Uh, nobody knows exactly when that happens, but a one-meter rise in sea level puts Waikiki underwater. Yep. Right, and it, and it also floats the, uh, it floats the sewage. It does that. It's uh, a lot of the uh, hotels were built when nobody worried about climate change or sea level rise. So a lot of the elevator equipment and uh, electrical equipment is in the basement. Yeah. So uh, those are all going to be have to be moved. Um, uh, we need to be thinking about those things now. Well, it's you know it's a domino kind of thing though. I mean, you some of these things that you described can be fixed. Mm -hmm. and yeah. We should talk about that, and we should try to be resilient about what we can be resilient about. Other things, um, you know, are, are way, as always the case in an island state, are way beyond our control. They happen somewhere else, and, and we're the unhappy recipients of whatever it is. Sure. I'm thinking tsunami, for example. Or SARS, even. We, we had no control over that. Most no control. So, I mean, really, the question is being smart. 
Like right. Singapore is smart. Right. And, and, and I wonder, you know, uh, HTA probably thinks about this all day. Jerry Agrusa's class writes papers about it. Yes. But, you know, what is our advice, you know, to the state? Singapore, people. Singapore is a good model. Okay. I did some work in Singapore for the Singapore Tourism Board, STB. They do a 25-year plan. They, and you, you might say you're crazy to think in a 25-year. What could, you know, think of all the things that could happen. But they say, yeah, things are going to happen, but we want to imagine what those things might be and prepare for them, whether they happen or not. Our current strategic plan for, uh, for HTA is a five-year plan. Okay, we're thinking five years. That's good. 10 years is better, 15 years is better. We need to, at least somebody, whether you actually have a, a plan uh, with that time horizon or not, we need to be thinking uh, in those terms that how do we want to work now to make the state what we want it to look like 20 or 30 or 40 years from now. And what I get also is that uh, when you're looking at um, unpredictable Mm, and negative experiences, a five-year plan doesn't see as many of them right. as a 25-year plan. So when you have a 25-year plan, by definition, you're looking harder at what might bring you down. Yeah. Right, and when we look at what we, we, we did predict, right, we saw this rise in the, in the economy of, for instance, China. And we thought, okay, then the Chinese will be, will be our number one international visitor. And now there's still only one-tenth of what the Japanese. But, but shame on us if we saw that rise coming. Uh, one of the reasons we may not have realized what we wanted to realize out of the China market is we didn't do enough about it. We don't have enough Mandarin-speaking uh, front desk staff. Mm, true. We don't signs have, or we, signs. Or signs. We don't have Mandarin channels on the TV. We don't have green tea in all the rooms. There are all those things that the Chinese visitor wants that you can accommodate. You just have to purposely do that. But there are certain properties, for instance, Four Seasons. I know that they just last, uh, last week or two weeks ago, they uh, added another Chinese uh, TV station to there. One of my students works there, and they said, we just added another Chinese-speaking t- t- TV station. And, and they, because the Four Seasons, because they get the money and they can charge, they can have people that are just allocating their time and efforts to match the needs of our, each particular guest. But in like Four Seasons, have you ever seen a commercial for a Four Seasons property? Nope, me either. So everybody's word of mouth a repeat visitor. But it, that's, Chinese is one example, but all these issues we talked about, uh, there's a solution for it. And despite my Dr. Doom title, I'm an optimist. Uh, for example, if, if, if you want to stabilize um, growth, you look for diversification markets. So you want to you wanna purposely develop markets in a, a portfolio sort of um, Approach. So you're covering all the possibilities, yes. all the areas of marketing. Yeah. And we went at one point in the 90s, 12 percent of our visitors came from places other than the U.S. and Japan, and uh, that went down to about three percent. It's back up to about eight or nine percent. So we're doing a good we're, thing, isn't it? It's the good thing. And then the question is, we all should agree on what that number should become, and then work toward that. Okay, I want to ask you guys to provide some advice, okay? Jerry, you're first. I'd like you to provide some advice to the state legislature and the people of the state on how to make tourism in Hawaii, the engine of our economy, you know, for sure, how to make it resilient in the long term. There's camera one. Why don't you, why don't you tell the legislature? They're all watching okay. right now. Yeah. Hello, aloha. Thanks, <laughs> Liam. Uh, I think that, they, you know, first of all, let's give credit to those that are doing a good job. HTA has to be doing a great job because we have record number of uh, visitors and record number of uh, uh, of tax revenue for, for the state. So let's give credit where it's due. Uh, what I would do is I try to maybe have a more uh, uh, an arm that helps the local community, both the Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian community, but also the other residents to understand how important tourism is to this state. We have folks that are not understanding and whether it's because they just don't uh, they don't see the numbers, or they just no one ever explained it to them that, you know, one out of four people working in the state is working directly in this business, and then there's another, you know, uh, you know, almost 40 percent if we add in that 25 percent that are, have something to do with tourism, and, and we need to have people understand that. Yes, this is our number one lifeblood. We don't have another industry to, to take this over at this time, and it employs lots and lots of people, and you can't outsource this. This is the great thing. You can't have it manufactured somewhere else. It has to be done here. 
Okay, uh, let me let me turn the question a little bit to you, Frank. Okay. What is your advice to the industry, to the capital concentrations in China, the U.S., uh, Britain? Um, you know, what should they be doing to cooperate with the community to make this work with the community over time to build a product that's completely collaborative and which is our best product? They're actually, actually shades of the Moana and Webley Edwards and Hawaii calls. How can we achieve that image that and 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 persist in our brand? One of the simple things to do is just realize what makes Hawaii so wonderfully special and to celebrate that because what's good for the visitor is good for the resident. If we really do embrace the authentic Hawaiian culture, authentic experiences, if we invest in festivals, events, activities that everybody wants to enjoy, it's a win-win. And um, the state has a role in this and that is to take the long, the long view. And nothing against the industry. The industry's done a terrific job, but they are looking at uh, short-term results. Uh, hotel general managers are, are rewarded very generously often on short-term results, like quarterly rev par and things like that. We need to be thinking, in, as Singapore does, in a 20, 30-year time horizon, and, and say, well, how can we, how can we invest? in this place, how can we celebrate those things that make us special so that brand remains vibrant? Yeah, win, 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 win. Yeah. Last question, okay. We have a new, you may have noticed, we have a new president and he is doing some things that mm, we predicted, maybe we didn't predict. Some of those things have an effect on Hawaii. Um, I don't think he's in love with Hawaii, it didn't vote for him. Um, and some of the things he's doing affect or could affect some of the things he might do could affect tourism. So, Jerry, could you could you talk to him for us, uh, Donald Trump, I mean, and give him some advice about what we would like from him? Should he care to care about us? Uh, well, Mr. President, uh, I hope that you will uh, look at markets that that uh, could be beneficial to us. Maybe lower the visa for some of the Chinese visitors. We could get more of them. Uh, I. I, I'm sure that you and your security team understand why you put uh, uh, blocks on those countries. Uh, I don't think we get a lot of tourists from Yemen, so I, I can't <laughs> see why we want to ever worry about that. that that's not going to help my students have jobs afterwards. They're, I haven't met anybody from Yemen ever here in Hawaii. But uh, I can see that if there's ways that we can help make it uh, our borders a little more uh, beneficial and, and get some of the, you know, the BRIC nations, uh, you know, the, the Brazil, uh, Russia, Russia. A lot of folks have a lot of money, and, and they and they like to tr they like to go tourism. They go to this place called Sunny Beach in Bulgaria, and it is packed. <laughs> and we we're a lot cleaner and nicer here than there. <laughs> so I would I would think that if he can make that uh, bend and mend that together, let's get some. We had some Russian tourists here for a while. There was some Russian <laughs> tours, and now I don't see them anymore. So let's get some more uh, and more diversity as as as. Uh, Professor Haas says, more diversity in, in who we get to come here so we're less vulnerable for when, when our market drops. Thank you, President. Jerry Grusa, uh, Professor of uh, Hospitality and Tourism at HPU, Frank Haas, a uh, tourism marketing consultant and professor at Capulana Community College. And